as Michael said, I'm an anesthesiologist. I do mostly trauma anesthesia and, um, and pre-hospital work. Um, and I started looking into this topic about the physiologically difficult airway uh, back in 2008 or something like that, where one of our nurse anesthetists had a really good lecture on pre-oxygenation, on how to uh, achieve better pre-oxygenation. And I thought the lecture was good, but it really lacked thing. And at the same time, there was starting to come pub uh, publications about the same topic, and um, there were starting to get discussions online. And then in 2016, Jared Mosher, he wrote this uh, seminal paper actually just defining what is the physiologically difficult airway. And to say, to say this, it's a normal airway that will, may turn ugly on you. So as we progressed over time, more publications came out uh, looking at different, uh, different uh, situations around physiological difficult airway. And now we also have two very good uh, guidelines from the Society of Airway Management and the Difficult Airway, Ma difficult airway Society. So as Michael told you, uh, and I, I'm just amazed when I see it's back from 2011, uh, this uh, landmark paper from uh, Tim Cook, um, uh, the NAP4 study, when you looked at airway management outside the OR, um, it was clear that there were more damage, more harm, more deaths when you handle airways with patients in the ICU and in the ED. So we need to do something to optimize these processes. And just um, this is the study from uh, the Intube study. Uh, there's just a lot of complications. And, these, and we, we need to get the tube in first, per, uh, first pass success. Does really matter. Uh, events, uh, complications just arrive when attempts arise. So we need to do some, something. And <coughs> don't peek too early. Uh, there was a study looking at uh, safety incidents in, uh, in UK anesthesia. And most of these airway problems, actually, they, they came uh, in about 20% of the, the cases, uh, they came uh, post-intubation. 80% uh, were actually life-threatening, contributing to 25% of the deaths in this study. So we need to do something. And what do we need to do? Well, first order of business is, look, slow down. For many of you HEMS guys, you might know your, prop, your, your pilots say when we run into uh, bad weather, reduce speed to see and avoid. And it's much the same thing, I think, when we're, do, when we're done with, uh, when we have to do airway management in physiological difficult airways. There are not a lot of patients that need intubation right now. Some do, but most don't. So um, reduce speed and resuscitate these different parts of the physiology, the hemodynamics, the oxygenation, and the, uh, the acidemia. And this is, you might be uh, familiar with the, the term, the hop killers coined by uh, uh, Dr. Weingart, uh, which you probably all are familiar with. And this term, so resusc resuscitate the, uh, the hop killers before you intubate. So first turning to the hemodynamics, the first step you need is what we need to talk about. Do we actually need to intubate the patient? And we had a lot of discussions at the MTAC yesterday concerning this problem. Because when you look at uh, pre-hospital trauma patients, you will actually see an increased mortality when you intubate the patient in the field. Of course, in these studies, there are uh, 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 bias, uh, confirmation bias, but uh, if, if you look, there was a really, really good study from uh, coming out of uh, the London HEMS looking at patients that were awake and hypertensive, and you showed that they had increased mortality when intubated. You also have delays in uh, to definitive care. You have much more technical complications and adverse, uh, and adverse physiological in the hypovolemic patient. So do we really need to intubate them? And this is much the same scene we see within the ED. So uh, you see the same picture, 
more deaths, more likely to uh, more likely to to uh, to have cardiac arrest when you intubate the patients in the ED versus in the OR. So we need to resuscitate these patients before proceeding to airway management. This is also will be is reflected in the guidelines right now. So this is a, a very small subset of the uh, guidelines from the Western Trauma Association and the National Association of EMS Physicians, uh, actually pointing to that we need to do some resuscitation of the shock patient before proceeding to airway management. And I, just a quick, uh, I will tell you, this will also be in the next ATLS guidelines, I'm sure. Um, so we could do resuscitation, we could give the patient some fluids, and the PREPARE 1 and 2 trials looked at this, putting in 500 milliliters in critically ill patients, and it actually didn't show a difference. I'm aware that there's a lot of problems with this study setup, but the main, uh, the main takeaway from this, these studies were it actually didn't make a difference to put in the 500 milliliters. So how about using vasopressors instead? Well, they are certainly faster to set up. They're titratable. You can use them peripherally, and they may be more effective, and they may avoid uh, fluid overload. Um, we don't know actually yet, but we are waiting uh, results from the uh, FLUVA trial looking at low-dose vasopressors uh, versus uh, fluid and the prevention trial uh, also looking at the use of uh, noradrenaline peri perioperatively or peri during peri-intubation. Uh, so <coughs> I guess everyone here knows that uh, dose does matter when it comes to choice of anesthetics. It hasn't really been studied that good, but I would my, uh, urge you to read uh, the paper from uh, uh, Robert Sikorsky and Rob, uh, uh, Richard Dutton out of uh, shock trauma that really g gives a really, really good uh, guideline how to manage anesthetic dosing during induction of anesthesia in, uh, in the shock trauma patient. So turning to oxygenation, um, you are all aware that being hypoxic is bad. So the farther you move uh, down the, uh, the, the slide on the left, you will have increased risk of cardiac arrest, brain damage, and death. And Benimov showed us which patients these are. These are the adult, uh, the normal patients, the obese patients, and you can, I think you could put in, if you really want, you could put the critically ill patients somewhere in here. So what we need to do, we had to optimize every step of uh, getting the patient oxygenated all through, uh, all through intuba the intubation uh, process. So good ventilation to good pre-oxygenation and use apneic oxygenation. So normally you would say, at least I was told, stick on a mask, have them breathe 100% uh, O2 for three minutes, you're golden. But I would say you have urge you to actually tr start using entitled O2 monitoring to see if you can push the patient uh, above 80-85%, have the patients sit up, ha use PEEP or CPAP, and have them do vital capacity breaths. That's a good way of optimizing your, your pre-oxygenation. And if you don't have a tight-fitting mask or an anesthetic machine, well, you can actually just use a, uh, a non-rebreather non -rebreather and a nasal cannula on flush. And it does provide you with uh, pre-oxygenation that is comparable to a good uh, uh, tight-fitting mask. Um, and actually, uh, the, uh, the guys out of, uh, out of uh, Stockholm, uh, Schublom, also to showed us in a study that you can ask, this is where, where we can actually set to tell the patient to shut up, because um, closed in the mouth does provide you better pre-oxygenation. So should we back them? Yes, I indeed think we should back them. There was a, a study from uh, in New England Journal of Medicine a few years ago uh, showing that you could actually back the patients uh, without having an increase in aspiration. And I know this study didn't provide, didn't w wasn't powered to actually answer that question whether the risk of aspiration, but at least it showed it could be done. So I think if you have the really hypoxic patient, well, back them during during uh, before um, before uh, intubating them. 
there's a huge push uh, towards using um, uh, non-invasive ventilation during pre-oxygenation and th all through uh, uh, ventilation until intubation. Um, the um, the uh, Florali study uh, didn't give us an answer to my, in my opinion, but I think it's at least it's a sound way of uh, providing pre-oxygenation. Uh, this should say Vapox, uh, and um, this is good study showing how you can set up your Hamilton ventilator to uh, to that specific uh, mode of uh, doing pre-oxygenation. So O's up the nose. Uh, what Rich has been told, telling us for years on. Uh, stick on a standard nasal cannula. Uh, it works um, in uh, quite a lot of simulated setups. It, uh, setup it will work in prolonged or uh, uh, simulated difficult airway managed difficult laryngoscopy. It works in anesthesia and works in, in obese patient. Unfortunately, it hasn't been shown that it does work in, in, uh, in the critically ill ICU patients. But it's cheap. It's readily available, and I don't see a reason why not to stick O's up the nose. So um, um, this is um, the, uh, the, uh, the can't pre-oxygen innovation. You have all met these patients. Maybe 4 or 5% of our patients will be in that category. You will try to pre-oxygenate them, and they will struggle against any attempt of pre-oxygenation. They're hypoxic, they're psychotic for whatever reason, they can't be pre-oxygenated, and we know we will really put them in a bad place. So you might all be familiar with the, uh, the delayed sequence intubation, uh, the difference from being the rapid sequence intubation, where we put in a delay for pre-oxygenation uh, using ketamine uh, for the ideal, uh, for as the ideal uh, anesthetic uh, anesthetic drug here. So. I think there's, a, um, there's both a physiological and clinical reason uh, to use, uh, use uh, a delayed sequence intubation. We did the original study showing, just in the observational study, that the patients tolerated this really good, and their SATs before intubations were higher. And there was a large study came, coming out of India showing the exact same thing uh, for trauma patients. So I think this is also a no-brainer. But uh, besides getting good pre-oxygenation, uh, using the DSI also provides you a lot of other uh, advantages. At least, uh, uh, m uh, not, uh, most importantly, it buys you time, you can get help, you gain control. So um, these are the added benefits. So lastly, um, looking at uh, patients that are um, acidotic. Um, I don't see a lot of these patients, uh, and there's not a lot of great literature around this. But um, I think from looking from a physiological perspective, this is sound uh, to, do, do, to, to stop thinking and ask yourself whether you should actually intubate these patients right now. Um, instead, correct the acidosis, bringing the pH to more than... And I, I'm sure that you all have a number in your head, which is, this is where I think everything would be working. And there are exper experimental data showing at least you have better cardiac function above seven point something, but we don't have a really, really thorough number, well-studied number that this is where you need to bring them. Um, so right now we, uh, we lean on expert opinion and it said bring the patients to more than 7.15. That should bring you in a better place uh, concerning circulation. And obviously, don't intubate these patients. They don't need to be intubated unless they are tiring and they're, do uh, and they're in progressive respiratory failure. In that instance, again, stick on some, uh, some uh, uh, non-invasive ventilation and correct the acidosis um, on, in, in while you oxygenate them. All right. Um, so how to set up your ventilator afterwards? Um, this is something I picked up from uh, the Rebel EM uh, website, which actually gives you a really, really good way of uh, calculating using Winter's equation uh, how to set up your uh, ventilator afterwards. Uh, how much minute ventilation you have, so the patient 
will keep their uh, keep their uh, metabolism in the right place. So, all right, that was a quick flyover of the physiologically uh, difficult airway.